All right, welcome everybody to Friday. So we are gonna go over the quiz real fast and then we're gonna be talking about ethical theories for uh, the rest of the class. Um, this background here says, I like you. I don't know what that means, but it says I like you. So I actually think this is a pretty cool, pretty cool background. I don't know. If you want the, the link to it, let me know from uh, wallpaper in, um, yeah, obviously. Okay, so, uh, you guys did pretty well on this quiz, so we do not need to do more quizzes on it for maybe the first time uh, in a long time. You guys actually did really well on the quiz. So 77% is good enough for uh, me to say you guys are passing. Uh, there's always some students that have no clue what's going on, so you know, I don't worry too much about them. Um, identify the form of the argument. If you study for this class, you will get an A. You got an A, you study for this class. So if X, then Y. Y is true. That is affirming the consequent. This part here, the if part is the uh, antecedent, and the uh, consequent is the then part. So you are affirming that the consequent is true in premise two. So premise one is usually <laughs> easy. <laughs> uh, premise one is usually conditional. Premise two uh, uh, is going to tie in with this. If premise two affirms the consequent, then it is in affirming the consequent fallacy. You study for this class, you'll get an A. You got an A, you study for this class. It is entirely possible to get an A in this class without studying. Okay, if you know the material already, you can get an A. I didn't say if you don't study, you'll get an F or something. So this is a affirming the consequent fallacy. Identify the form of this argument. If you win the lottery, you will buy a house. You won the lottery, you bought a house. If X, then Y. X is true, therefore Y is true. Uh, the uh, antecedent is true. Therefore, we can conclude the consequent is true. This is modus ponens. It's a sta straight up logical deduction. It's the easiest one. Most people can get it. And like I said, there's usually you know a couple percentages of people that that don't. But um, yeah. what can you do? Nobody's perfect. Um, identify the form of this argument. If you're a fantasy fan, you will have read or watched Lord of the Rings. I don't think this is sound, but we're not worrying about sound for this quiz. We're worrying about logical validity. So if you are a fantasy fan, that is the antecedent, X, if you if X, then you will have watched or read Lord of the Rings. Why? The consequent. Denying uh, the consequent is not a fallacy. This is modus ponens. So if X, then Y, not Y, therefore not X. Because if you were a fantasy fan, you guaranteed 100% would have watched Lord of the Rings. And since you haven't, we can tell from this you are not, in fact, a fan of fantasy. Okay, so uh, this is modus tollens, or tollens, I've heard it called. 75%, uh, this one gives people struggles sometimes. And then uh, this uh, denying the antecedent is also, a, you know, the hardest, uh, apparently, for people to recognize. So if X, then Y. If you live in Fresno, then you like eating beer rocks. Premise two, denying the antecedent. You do not live in Fresno. C, conclusion. You do not like eating beer rocks. So uh, this is clearly wrong, right? Because uh, it is possible for people in San Francisco to like eating beer rocks as well. It is possible for people in Canada to like eating beer rocks as well. All we said is that if you live in Fresno, then you like eating beer rocks. Okay? We did not say anything that like people in LA hate them or something like that. So you cannot conclude that just because you do not live in Fresno, you do not like eating beer rocks. So this is a denying the antecedent. So we have if x, then y, x is the antecedent, we deny the antecedent, fallacy. Okay, boom. All right, so let's talk about ethics. Um, and ethics is, uh, the slides helped out a lot, good, I'm glad. Like I said, like those those four slides, like you should just copy them down or make note cards or something, because they're gonna come up a lot in this class. Uh, okay, so let's talk about uh, we're going to be talking about the Izot problem today. Uh, we're going to talk about probably the first three ethical systems today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the naturalistic fallacy. Okay. So the Izot problem um, is, it, it derives from an old philosopher named David Hume, who lived uh, in, you know, long, long ago, like 1800s England, something like that. And uh, have any of you guys heard of Hume Lake here in, uh, like, uh, what chapters do you have for side books? It's on it's on Canvas. 
Yeah. Yeah. Human Lake, as far as I can tell, is not named after him. So. <laughs> okay. Um, so. <laughs> uh, uh, it'd be kind of strange because uh, it's a Christian um, summer camp area and Christian groups don't like Hume very much. Okay. So there's this problem in science, right? And the problem in science is that science describes the world as it is, right? Uh, there is a black chair sitting next to me over here. It is an empirical statement. It's a statement of the world that is. What Hume pointed out is that there is no obvious or easy way of going from there is a chair sitting next to me to you should not have a chair sitting next to you or you should have a chair sitting next to you. Like just because the world is a certain way doesn't mean that the world should be that way. Okay. Now, a lot of people are sort of comfortable with the status quo, right? And uh, uh, anytime you have a proposition that's going to make a change in California, there tends to be sort of a resistance against change, right? So like uh, we have what's called status quo bias in, in humans. Um, we're, you know, America is probably never going to replace our um, bicameral, you know, legislative, you know, bodies, the Senate and the House of Representatives with uh, a House of Lords and Parliament like we have in England. Like, even if, you know, even if we're like, oh, you know, maybe that system's better. Like we just, like we got our institutions, you know, we're just going to stick, like we just tend to just stick with things that we know, right? And in part, and in part it kind of makes sense. It's like, well, we know how it works. And it, it, even though it's not perfect, like, you know, uh, you're going to throw the world into chaos and, you know, it's maybe not worth it, you know? So like status quo bias is kind of understandable, right? Like when things are kind of going all right, then you don't want to just make changes willy nilly. Um, but the problem with this is like when you've got, uh, a, a scenario where there is an ethical problem in society, it can be hard to change it, right? Because can anybody think of a moral topic in U.S. history that uh, ended up causing a bit of conflict in order to change our ethical, you know, notions of what's right and wrong? World War Two. Which one? Uh, what what ethical uh, thing were we uh, changing ISIS? So uh, Seth, what uh, what ethical issue uh, were we uh, discussing, so to speak, in the Civil War? The Great Emu War, of course. I mean that goes without saying. The the Emu War, uh, but we're talking about American history here, not Australian history. So what 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 uh, what ethical systems? you know, what ethical issue, rather, um, was being changed as a result of the Civil War and World War II. Uh, racism. Yeah, I don't know if racism was exactly, um, <laughs> you know, the issue. Uh, exactly. You know, like slavery, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, voting rights. Um, yeah, I mean... I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say voting rights for the Civil War, but, um, but yeah, like we had, you know, if, if, if you look at the past, like, you know, something like, I don't know, 90% of human civilizations, I don't know, I'm just making up a number, uh, have had slavery in them, you know, historically speaking. And uh, COVID-19, doctors had to decide who might get a state of life or not, form of utilitarianism. Uh, yeah, so... Um, In the Civil War, you know, you had status quo bias. You had the naturalistic fallacy. You know, we slavery is legal. That's the way it should be, right? And uh, a number of people, not everyone, certainly. Um, abolitionism was not that widespread, even in the North, uh, to be honest. Um, but there were, there were enough people that said, no, you know, just because slavery is legal does not mean that slavery should be legal. Okay. And in order to make that, in order to make that um, argument, 
you can't just use science, okay? So science uh, has this, this problem, right? Science can go out there and say, you know, in the South, 23% of people are slave owners. And, you know, like you sit there and you can go out and do a study. You can make empirical observations. And empirical observation is when you, you know, go out and, and look at things and write them down. And, and maybe you make a model from it, right? Like if you uh, boil water, you know, you sit there and you have your Bunsen burner and your beaker and you have a thermometer and you take observations, you graph it. That's empirical. Normative statements are saying things like slavery is wrong. Okay. So uh, slavery is wrong, right? And you can't go from like slavery exists to slavery is wrong. You have to have some sort of ethical system in order to go from is to ought. You know, this is the way things are, but the way things are is wrong. Okay. And, um, uh, current slide Jim Crow. Yeah. Uh, so Jim Crow was the status quo in the, you know, 1920s, let's say, um, among other times. And, uh, you know, somebody would have to say, well, it's wrong. Right. And you can't, you can't use science for it. Science is incapable of making those sorts of normative statements. A normative statement says, this is right. This is wrong. You should do this. You should not do that. Science can say fire trucks are red. But they cannot say, you know, it's immoral to have a red fire truck. That's just, there, there's no mechanism in science for it to say that it's immoral for fire trucks to be red. Doesn't even make sense. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so status quo bias is a real, is a real kicker, you know, because sometimes, like, sometimes it's right, you know, like, you probably don't want to just change like your government institutions every five minutes, you know, because there is a certain value to stability in a society, right? Like there's probably, you probably need a little bit of it, you know, um, because if, if everything changes, if the rules, if the laws change every five seconds, like you can't write contracts, you can't have a job, you know, change it every hour, you know, like, like you know, like there's probably some, you know, benefit to, the status quo uh, bias, but yeah, like when there's something wrong, you need to have an ability to change it. So um, there are no rules, man, we're lost. Um, science can tell you what the best course of action to take is on something sometimes, right? And it sometimes can, right? Like if, you, if you're like trying to figure out how to help starving people, you know, um, science can tell you like, oh, you know, you need to avoid repeating syndrome and, you know, here's the nutrition that works the best, but it can't tell you it's moral to feed starving people. Yeah. Do you guys see the difference there? Like, so, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, Ismail. like, you know, science can definitely say like, yeah, if, if somebody is starving to death, they might need an IV feed with fluids first, like, like that kind of stuff, but it can't tell you it's right to help a, a starving person or it's wrong or, you know, or you should do something. Right. Okay. So, um, but naturalistic fallacy is very popular. You know, like, uh, somebody will say, you know, it's natural for us to do something. Therefore it's right. Um, you know, it's, um, Oh, it's, a. Uh, natural for girls to be wanted to put it into groups with other girls, you know, things like that. And, um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's really, it's really dicey because, you know, uh, you know, how do you, how do you know it's right versus just it's your bias in, in play, right? Like that's, that's kind of a hard thing to, to tease, to tease apart sometimes. Like, you know, like, are you just talking out of your bias or is it actually better that way? So science isn't always right. Well, it's not a matter of science being right. It's it's the matter of science can't do ethics, right? Um, it it can give yeah it can give you options like uh, Alex says it can give you options for like you know you could try helping a starving person this way or you try helping a starving person this way. But if they're if they've been trapped under rubble, then this way is probably better. But it can't tell you you should help somebody. It can't tell you you should, you know, um, you know, feed a starving person. It can't tell you 
you should help the homeless. Like there's no, there's no mechanism in science for that. And in fact, science has been rather bad uh, over the years. Um, Cause there, there's, there's sometimes a principle in science, like, you know, that science is paramount, right? Like that nothing should get in the way of science. And um, that brings us to questions of ethics and morality. So um, the, uh, Technically, you know, you might say that there's a difference in these terms. Um, a lot of times we talk about ethics in terms of, in terms of like professional ethics, like the ethics that regulate your profession. Like if you're a security guard, then you have a professional obligation not to just abandon your post and let people in without checking them, I guess. Uh, if you're a, uh, a pilot, you have an ethical obligation not to drink uh, before, you know, flying a plane. Um smoking pot before flying a plane, although I think there might have been a movie on that. Soul Plane, yeah. I think, I have, ne I have not seen this movie, so don't quote me on this, but, uh, you yeah. uh, know, I think he might not have been following the ethical um, rules for pilots. I'm not sure, though. Uh, if you just rely on science, when you just become an AI, um, yeah, I mean AI, they're programming ethics into AI. So, so anyway, what I'm saying is that, like in in normal usage, like ethics kind of refers to like your professional obligations, and morality refers to your personal inner sense of right and wrong. Um, but uh, for this class, we're just going to use the terms interchangeably just to make things simple. Okay. Yeah. Now, um. You know, so, I mean, there was, there was an issue like in science, right? Where, you know, science ethics are not even that old. Like, like I said, like in science, there's been this long standing tradition of like, nothing should get in the way of science. Like, you know, inquiry and discovering, you know, reality is the only thing that matters in science. And so there's a certain appeal to that, right? Like, you know, you shouldn't allow, you shouldn't allow politics to intervene in science, right? But, um, but what is really reality? It's, you know, I mean, science tries to get at it. Like, you know, you don't have like everything in science is probability, right? Like we're 95% confident this is true. We're 99% confident this is true, but reality could be completely different. We could just be wrong, you know? Uh, but you know, it's all probability and confidence levels and things like that. But the, uh, the the problem is there were a series of high profile science experiments that people said, you know what, that's wrong, you know, and that's again, that's not something that science can handle, right? Like if you if you want to talk about uh, you want to talk about stupid sexy Flanders, no, what am I looking for? Um, if we're looking for loot boxes. No, here we go. Okay, so if you're if you're if you're talking about like science experiments gone bad, uh, the U.S. government ran a study for forty years on uh, these African American men who had syphilis, and they wanted to study to see what the long term effects of syphilis was on people, and they told these people they were being treated for syphilis and they weren't. The government lied to them and uh, basically a hundred of them died of the syphilis as a result. 40 of them infected their wives. 20 kids were born with congenital syphilis. Like it was a jacked up thing to do. And so uh, people, when they found out about this, were like, holy smokes, dude, that's not cool. <laughs> right? Like there, there is something more important than just the pursuit of knowledge and science. You should not be lying to people and letting them suffer from syphilis and telling them you're, you're going to cure them. You know, uh, you know, penicillin had been out for, uh, what was penicillin out? Uh, penicillin. Yeah. So, uh, by 1947, the antibiotic was widely available and they could have cured them and they chose not to. They just wanted to see, what would happen if we just let people have syphilis for 40 years? So, um, 
Stanford study. Yeah, the Stanford study is a famous one. Uh, another one would be Operation Sea Spray, uh, where the U.S. Navy sprayed biological weapons over San Francisco just to see what would happen. Um, the bacteria were supposed to be harmless. Uh, as it turned out, um, 11 people got very sick. Uh, one of them died from it. Um, you know, as you do. Uh, Unit 731, if you just want to hate humanity, you can read about Unit 731 in, uh, in Japan, which is absolutely uh, one of the worst examples of humanity being horrible to other humans in human history. Uh, they would flamethrower people uh, to see what would happen. You know, prisoners, you know, just 200, 300,000 people killed. Uh, they would test and develop biological weapons. Um, they would amputate people's arms to see how long it would take them to bleed to death. Uh, absolute um, atrocity. And the, the worst part of Unit 731 is the U.S. government pardoned the head of the unit in order to get his... Um, research so the uh, the guy who uh, uh, who was in, responsible for some of the absolute worst war crimes in human history uh, was granted immunity so there you go you go America you go uh, and then of course you have loot boxes from EA which is right up there now um, why would they do that? Well, because uh, they wanted the research, right? Like, so they uh, wanted to know, um, oh, uh, the uh, sea spray. Uh, they wanted to see how bacteria would spread. Like if, if somebody launched a biological weapon at, uh, at San Francisco, how would it spread, you know? And so they had monitoring locations set up and everybody inhaled, you know, the particles and, uh, and, uh, um, and so between 1949 and 1969, open air tests of biological agents were conducted 239 times. Yep. And, uh, so yeah, the, uh, unethical human experimentation in the U S if <laughs> you know, there, so basically after the 1970s, um, um, we we had a change in science. We we're like, you know what? All these kinds of things are a little, yeah, a little jacked up. You know, like maybe there's something, uh, maybe there's something more important than science, right? And that's that's tough for some people to accept, right? Like there's still some people today that say, no, you know, science should be unfettered by ethics. Uh, most people though would say, you know, it's, it's probably not a good idea to do like what. Uh, Mengele did in the Nazis um, would take twins and torture one, you know, to see if the other twin had a psychic connection to the one twin that was being tortured. And, like, absolute horrible, horrible stuff. Um, what's the crazy ex experiment the government did with people? Um, the U.S. government or uh, any government? Like, the Unit 731 is probably worse even than what Mengele did in my opinion, because they were actually like making biological weapons and dumping them on villages and stuff like that. Uh, unethical human experimentation in the United States. Uh, in the 60s. Um, Uh, sprayed U.S. ships with biological and chemical warfare agents uh, while people were above them. Personnel were not notified of the tests and not given any protective clothing. They released bacteria into the New York subway system, uh, radiation experiments, uh, uranium and plutonium experiments, fallout over Vegas. Um, I don't know, man. Uh, you can... Uh, Prisoners as subjects. Let's see here. How do you hurt? Like they're spring prisoners with dioxin and stuff. I don't know. Take your pick. I'll post the link on. Uh, I'll post the link on Discord. Uh, I'm not gonna 
get a rule on which one of those is the worst. They all seem pretty horrible to me. So uh, you can. Uh, okay. Uh, you can you can take your pick. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. So basically, nowadays we have what's called an institutional review board. So if you want to, um, if you want to do human experimentation you have to get an IRB to sign off on it. And so that was one of the changes made uh, in the 1970s. I think 74 was when IRBs came online. And um, I mean, it, it's not even the military though. Like, you know, like the in medicine, like they, uh, they did an experiment where they wanted to see what would happen if they swapped out somebody's morphine feed for water to see if the placebo effect worked. And it did, you know. But I would, you know, argue that that's probably an, an, an unethical, you know, violation of patients' rights. You know what I mean? So, uh, um, that's, you know, that's how medicine was in the 60s and science was in the 60s, right? Um, so, nowadays we have ethics. Okay. So... Talking specifically about computer science, on uh, on Monday we're going to be talking about the ethics of ChatGPT. Um, you know they're villains and they dress all in white. That's funny. Uh, and computer science has really changed the world, right? And and one of the really sad things about you know all of this is that computer scientists, generally speaking, we don't study ethics, um, like. It's not usually required that, you know, it's changing now. Like the ACM, the International Computer Science Association is really pushing to have like an ethics class mandatory for computer scientists because by and large, we, we like our attitude, you know, over the past, you know, 50 years that computer science has existed has been, can we make it? Can we, you know, can I make an AI that will get people out of parking tickets, right? Which is an actual thing. And we don't stop to consider, like, what happens if everybody gets out of their parking tickets, right? I can tell you what's happening at my college, at Clovis Community College. Right now, we're, we're not issuing parking tickets. And so what, where do you think students are parking now? If you're not going to ticket people for parking in, let's say, mm, staff parking, what do you think happens to the staff parking? Thought it was when you were a prisoner? Uh, no, the Tuskegee experiment was not on prisoners. Those were just on people in the Tuskegee community in conjunction with the Tuskegee Institute, which is a black college. Gym. Uh, yeah, AI is changing the world. Um, computer science is changing the world immensely. And we're doing so without thinking about the ethical consequences of things, which is um, uh, worrisome, right? When we're making video games, yeah, I mean, video games are kind of a lower stakes thing. Yeah, there's no more staff parking, right? So, like, I'm I'm trying to find a spot, you know, and if I'm late for class, everyone's late for class because class can't start without me, right? And so I'm sitting there, like, driving back and forth in the staff parking, and I'm seeing students getting out of cars in the staff parking, and I'm like, bro, like, really? You know, and so I have to, like, drive and go into, like, the corner back lot and, you know, um, and so when students know they're not going to be ticketed for parking and staff parking. Like there's just students taking up all of the staff parking spots, you know? And so, you know, what do you do? You paint more of them staff, you know, than like it, there's no, you know, if, if there's no consequences for things, then, you know, people will exploit it. Yep. So staff will need to do, I know it's like when I had to park in the back lot, I'm like, what is this? Some sort of like, my a peon now? Like, what's going on here? I need my privileges. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, there's a new segment about AI chat we use for an essay assignment. What teachers' opinions are about it? They're not happy. Yeah, but like I said, like, if if AI essays can be detected, and they probably can, uh, I I don't I don't think that any any student's going to want to risk their academic career for submitting one as them. Uh. Yeah, is, is this a is this a poor joke that I'm too rich to understand? You know, one of those one of those kinds of things. How dare you try to mix me in with that filth? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's like I'm a proletariat now or something like that. It's it's utterly unacceptable. Okay, <laughs> I kid, I kid. Um, 
So, yeah, so like computer science is changing the world and we do so only wondering if we could, not wondering if we should, right? So, for those of you that didn't get the reference, I feel bad for you. Uh, there you go. Uh, Jurassic Park, of course. Uh, your scientists are so pre preoccupied whether they or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. That is computer science um, in a nutshell over the past 25 years. And so there's a there's a book you can read on this called System Error. Uh, it's a bit biased and one-sided. I, I don't know if I could highly recommend it, but basically it sort of makes this point that like, um, um, it, it's, it's, it's really not, I would have a hard time like recommending it wholeheartedly because it's a very one-sided book. Like it is very biased. Um, like at, at some point, like the authors just say, we don't understand why people would act this way. You know, when, when people disagree with them, they just say, we just can't comprehend how anybody could be opposed to us, you know? And, and that's not a good sign. Like when you're, when you're writing a book on, you know, ethics, like to me, like you, you sort of owe it to like the readers of the book sort of understand the other side at least so like it's not just all one-sided it's um yeah i read this a while back but uh yeah it, it makes this argument like you know what if everybody gets out of a parking ticket right now you know you have chaos you know and so yeah it's great you can make an ai that gets people out of a parking ticket but what is the consequence of it what happens when you actually succeed and that's something that a lot of people don't think about is like we were like can we make a product not, are we going to screw up the world if it works? You know, <clears throat> Google, Facebook, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So, uh, yeah. And so that's why we're studying ethics, okay? That's why this class is important. And, you know, like I said, the, the ACM uh, is, the ACM is the International Computer Science Association. You know, I was, I was attending a conference last March, and we were sitting in on a thing. We're, like, working on, like, ethical um, like basically talking about mandating ethics and what should be in an ethics class and what kind of questions should be asked in an ethics class and things like that. And uh, what I discovered was that like almost none of the professors there that were putting together these like ethics sections had actually taken ethics themselves. Like, so it's almost like a chicken and the egg problem. It's like, all right, well, how are you going to write an ethics section for computer science if you've never taken it, right? And and they all had these like really vague notions of like why things are wrong. And I was asking them, I'm like, all right, which which ethical system, you know, like we're talking about here, which ethical system, you know, are you guys using in your in your in your questions and in, in, in your essays and things like that? And they have no idea what I was talking about. And I was like, that's not good, because this is like basic ethics. And I'm in a group of like 30 people and like maybe two of them knew actual ethics. Um, so I don't know. We'll see how that goes. Um, ethics is fun. It's, it's very interesting too. Okay. So yeah, like there's a lot of ethical consequences of like drone strikes and facial recognition and uh, you know, Facebook, is it a force for good or a force for evil? And here's the thing. I'm not going to tell you um, like I'm, I'm somewhat sarcastic, you know? And so like, you know, I'll say, you know, kind of sarcastic things, but in, in all honesty, um, you're not supposed to know what I actually believe. Like I'll, I'll say, you know, Facebook, uh, you know, it's their, it's their job to invade people's privacy and things like that. But it's, it's me just sort of telling a joke, right? The, um, the goal in this class isn't for you to try and learn what I think about Facebook. And you're, you'd probably be wrong about it actually. If you, if you, if you just guessed it off the jokes that I tell, um, the, uh, but that's not your point. The point of this class is for you to figure out yourself what ethical system you want to use and use that to determine if what Facebook is doing is right or wrong. Okay. If drone strikes are right or wrong, if facial recognition is right or wrong. And, and it, it's not, it doesn't even have to be like a complete black and white thing, right? Like maybe facial recognition is okay in some circumstances, but not in others. Like that's up to you. Okay. So what I want 
is just for you to think about. That's it, right? When you graduate from here and you get a job and you're working for Facebook and, and somebody proposes, hey, let's do automatic facial recognition on every image uploaded to Facebook and we can make a database of every person's face in America and be able to recognize every person in America, just have that moment of like, what sort of ethical implications does that have? You know, like that's it. Like I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm just telling you to think about it. Okay. Just that it's a very low bar that I, that I'm, that I'm asking from you guys. Do you guys understand here? Like, I just want you to like have that moment where you like pause and be like, Hmm, you know, what would happen if we had a database of every person's face in America and we could automatically tag people? Uh, how could this be used? How could this be misused? You know, and just think about it a little bit. And if you do that, um, my, my hope is the worst abuses at least will be avoided. Yep. Is ethics a requirement for computer science or is it a, just a GE? So at, at Fresno State, it is a GE requirement. Um, the, uh, the violinist problem, yeah, that would be, um, uh, uh, what was your name? Uh, 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 Thompson. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, but we're talking actually in the department here of having like an upper division ethics requirement in computer science because it's, it's so important, right? We're, we're changing the world. And we're changing the world without really thinking about if what we're doing is right or wrong. And, and that's worrisome, right? It's very worrisome. Uh, absolutely prolific lecture, change your life. Dr. Cole at Fresno City College. Yeah. Or, or you know, this is technically an ethics class too, a little bit, at least. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about in this class, the five major uh, ethical systems. Um, and I'm not going to tell you which one you should adopt for yourself. I am leaving that up to you. When you do uh, an essay on ethics, and like I said on uh, Monday, we're going to be talking about chat GPT. You're going to say, I am using divine command theory for my ethical system. Now, a lot of students will say that and then have no idea what divine command theory is. And if your essay doesn't use divine command, so divine command theory is like, um, God says murder is wrong, so murder is wrong, right? If, if, you, if you say, I'm using divine command theory, and then you don't have any invocation of religion at all in your essay, uh, it's wrong, right? Like you did not use the ethical system correctly, okay? So when you, when you pick an ethical system for your essays, you actually have to use them, okay? It's very common for students to say, I'm using, and then they roll a die, I'm using utilitarianism, and then uh, they don't actually use utilitarianism because they don't understand it, so pay attention. So we're gonna go over the first three ethical systems today. We'll go over the other two on Monday, and then we will uh, use these ethical, ethical systems to talk about chat GPT and uh, maybe cancel culture in the future. That's, that's something I've been wanting to talk about with students for a long time. Okay, so divine command theory, good news, is the easiest one to understand. So uh, when uh, we talk about divine command theory, it doesn't just mean like the Christian God or the God of Abraham, you know, and Moses, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Mormonism, all of them share the same sort of God of Abraham. It does not mean just that one. It can also refer, divine command theory is like, if you're a Sikh and you follow the gurus, that's divine command theory, right? If you say what's right or wrong comes from my religion, doesn't matter what your religion is. If you're a Buddhist, if you're Hindu, if you're Sikh, if you're uh, Jewish, if you're an uh, animist, doesn't matter, okay? Uh, if, if you determine your sense of right or wrong from your religion, that is DCT, divine command theory. Okay. So basically, um, you know, God says, boom, here's Moses, here's 10 commandments. You know, you should not murder, you should love God. You should respect your mother and father. Um, and you should not covet your neighbor's ass. That's, that's one of them, right? So, uh, if, if God says you should not covet your neighbor, your neighbor's ass, then, you should not covet your neighbor's ass. Like, it doesn't matter how stupid, sexy Flanders looks. Um, there it is uh, right there in the Bible. You shall not covet uh, your neighbor's ass. And again, I am. Uh, am I joking? No, it's actually in the Bible, but um, ass means, you know, donkey. Uh, all right. So, uh, so the, the, the pros of that is that uh, 
it's hard to argue with, right? Like if you're, if you're like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Jew and Jews have like, what is it? 613 or 617 mitzvah, right? They have over 600 commandments essentially. Then like, you know, you don't really argue with it. It's like, all right, these are, this is my code of being and I'm going to follow these rules. And depending on if you're a reform or conservative or orthodox Jew, uh, you know, you have different attitudes towards the 600 some odd mitzvah. And, uh, but basically, yeah, you're just like, all right, God says not to eat pork. So I don't eat pork. It's easy. Like it's a very straightforward system. Uh, on the quiz today, you're going to have to recognize these three and the divine command theory ones. Almost everybody gets right. It's like, God tells me not to eat pork. So I don't eat pork in Hinduism, Hinduism, you're not supposed to eat beef. So I don't eat beef. Right. Jainism, you're not supposed to harm any living creature. So, you know, I don't harm any living creature. It's very easy to recognize. It's very easy to apply. Uh, the downside, the downside to it is it doesn't help you if you are arguing with somebody from a different religion. Right. So if, uh, in, you know, in India, you have, uh, you have an Islamic population, you have a Hindu population. And one of them says you can't eat pork. The other one says you can't eat beef. You can't really resolve that disagreement. You know what I mean? It's it's not like one of them, like you can sit down at a debate and be like, oh, you should eat pork. Oh, you should eat beef. Like there's no real way of resolving that. You know, there's no, you know, it's just like, this is what mine says. This is what mine says. Okay, let's eat chicken. All right, cool. You know, <laughs> let's, let's go get some Panda Express. You know, let's get some orange chicken, you know. Uh but you know, there, and then there's some religions that don't eat chicken either, right? If you're if you're a strict Buddhist, you know, you're not supposed to eat chickens. If you're a Jainist, uh, you're not supposed to eat chickens either. So, you know, I don't know. Eat eat your veggies. That's I guess the one thing everybody agrees on is that broccoli is okay. I guess. So, so that's one of the downsides to DCT is it it doesn't really give you any uh, ability to sort of debate with people that disagree with you, right? This is sort of like. This is what it says. And you're like, yep, it, that's what it says. And mine says this. Okay. You know, uh, fortunately, you know, pretty much all the religions agree that, you know, things like murder is wrong. So like on the big points, like um, there's actually not that much disagreement. Al although we like to say, you know, how, uh, how much religions disagree with each other. And in reality, like, uh, you know, none of them are like, yeah, pro stealing, you know. <laughs> so. It also doesn't help if you're an atheist. It also doesn't help um, uh, if you're like trying to come up with um, laws for a society. Like in in America, at least, like we have a secular society, which means that there's no official state religion. And so, if there's no state religion, then you can't use just a purely religious commandment in your laws, right? And so, you need something else to justify a law. Yeah. And we'll get to that on Monday. All right, thoughts on this, and then we'll move on. We've got a few minutes left. Um, nothing? Okay. Um, it, it is pretty straightforward, and on the quiz, you should be able to recognize it pretty easily. Okay, now utilitarianism. So uh, utilitarianism is a subset of consequentialism. Consequentialism is a set of ethical theories that look at the outcome of an action. Okay? So if you're talking about religion, we want to see if it's divine, if it's true. Um, yeah, it, it almost doesn't matter if the religion is actually divine, you know, because like if, uh, if people all, you know, like if you, if you say I'm a Jew, I'm going to adopt these 600 some odd mitzvah, then you adopt them. Like it, 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 to a certain extent, doesn't matter if it's true or not, because like you've signed on to the program, you know, and this is my code of conduct for good and evil. Okay, so uh, uh, so utilitarianism is a subset of consequentialism. Consequentialism is the notion that outcomes are what matter. So if you um, if you uh, are trying to feed the homeless and uh, you try feeding the homeless and you accidentally give them food poisoning because you're using like day old food, like you're at a restaurant, you got this food left over, you feed the homeless and they get food poisoning and die, then under consequentialism that was an evil action you did. Okay. Whereas under Kant, uh, Kant cares more about duty. You have a duty to do something, and the outcome actually doesn't really matter that much. What matters is that you're following your duty to do it. And so 
deontology is about duty, about your intentions, about your obligations. Consequentialism is uh, worrying about outcomes of actions, more or less. Okay. And so under utilitarianism, what you're trying to do is you're trying to maximize the most good for the most people and minimize evil. Or and what is but what is good, what is evil? Uh, it depends on the form of utilitarianism. In this class, we're studying the most basic form of utilitarianism, which is called ethical hedonism. So it defines pleasure as good and pain as bad. And pleasure doesn't mean like sexual pleasure or like the pleasure you get from shooting up heroin. Pleasure is a catch-all phrase for like um, bodily health, joy, feelings of well-being, being accepted by society, um, you know, all those kind of positive emotions, right? And pain is all of the negative emotions. It doesn't just mean somebody's like slapping you in the face. You're like, ah, oh, it hurts. Uh, pain could be like social rejection, uh, where like people ignore you deliberately and exclude you from events. Uh, it could be like getting cancer. It could be, um, you know, being sad in general. Um, there's all sorts of forms of pain under utilitarianism. So, um, so under utilitarianism, you're basically trying to maximize pleasure and minimize pain for the most number of people. And so what you do to figure out if something is ethical or not in utilitarianism is you do what's called the philosophic calculus. So you add up all of the pleasure from the action you're going to do and you subtract all the pain. And if you're inflicting more pleasure than pain, you're doing good, kid. But if your action is going to inflict more pain than pleasure, you shouldn't do that. So if you're in a, if you're thinking to yourself like, hmm, should I steal that person's wallet? Their their wallet is just sitting out there on the desk, and they got some money in it. I could just take it, right? Under utilitarianism, you would say, well, that person's going to suffer a lot of pain, and I'm only going to get a small amount of pleasure from stealing it. Therefore, stealing the money is unethical. So more pain than pleasure is considered moral. No, the opposite. You you have to have more pleasure than pain. Or to be moral. If you inflict more pain than pleasure, then uh, it is an evil action. And so, uh, yeah, so in, in Star Trek 2, uh, Spock sacrifices himself under the principle of utilitarianism. He says, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So he sacrifices his life to save the life of everybody on the Enterprise. And that is a classic utilitarian uh, outlook, right? And um, so, um, um, there are downsides to this, though. And, and like a downside might be like, well, what if I just enjoy stealing a lot, right? Like if that if that wallet's there, and I really get a kick out of taking somebody's money, then the pleasure that I get from stealing their money is greater than the pain they experience from having their stuff stolen. Therefore, it's good. And so the good or evil uh, of an action depends in part upon how much I enjoy evil or what most people would consider evil, right? If I really like stealing, it's good now, you know, and, and most people would say, well, there's something wrong about that. Um, or another example would be um, like the Roman gladiatorial games, right? And so... Uh, the gladiatorial games, uh, you know, you would have people fighting, sometimes to the death, uh, sometimes not. And uh, and you have, it's still blood sport, right? And so you have people bleeding, getting hurt. But you've got 40,000 people there in the Flavian Amphitheater enjoying it. And so it's good under utilitarianism. So uh, DM, and some people would say, well, that's there's something wrong about that. Now, John Stuart Mill was a disciple of Jeremy Bentham. Bentham was a guy who invented ethical hedonism. John Stuart Mill was kind of a nerd. He said, well, you know, you have to separate out pleasures. There's the higher pleasures and then there's the base pleasures. And anybody who's enjoyed a good book does not enjoy the base pleasures of life, like drinking and sleeping around and stuff like that, because uh, he was a nerd. Okay. So uh, Kantian ethics, uh, Kantian ethics is the opposite of that. It involves your duty to something. What obligations do you have? 
And Kant's big think was that um, if you want to find out if you have a duty to do something, it's pretty simple. You think about, you, you imagine in your head, what if everybody did this action, right? What if every, like you see the wallet there in front of you and you're like, I don't know, should I steal it or not? You know, and so you think to yourself, like, what if everybody stole? Uh, the world would fall apart, right? You, you would come home and there'd be people in your house. Your car is gone. Uh, somebody stole the tree off the front yard. You know, like the world would just be an absolutely horrible place to live in. But like, what if nobody stole? And you imagine that and you're like, oh, the world's actually pretty good. Like, okay. You know, so if you imagine like these two outcomes, what if everybody did it? And what if everybody didn't do it? And you imagine those two possibilities, you can tell pretty clearly what your duty is. If, if everybody did the thing and the world is great, you must do that. If, whereas when the opposite op option is the world would fall apart, you have a duty not to do that. And so uh, a famous example in Kantian ethics is if a murderer asks you, hey, where is Chris Vienna? You know, I want to murder him. Uh, you know, Kant would say you can't lie to the person, right? Because you have a duty never to lie. The consequence of your action doesn't matter, really. Um, what matters is your duty. He's over, he's over there, right? And, uh, and that's, you know, pretty hardcore about it, right? Never lie, never cheat, never steal, period. Like, that's just Kant, very hardcore, like, no, there's, don't make an exception for yourself. Just don't ever lie, you know? And so, um, clear set of rules. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty clear, right? Sometimes. You know, some some questions can get a little bit tricky, like, do I have a duty to drive a car? That that gets a little bit dicey, because if nobody drove, the world would kind of suck. And if everybody drove, the world would kind of suck. So I don't know, like, you know, that it gets dicey there. So, but for things like murder and things like that, like, it gives you a very clear, like, no. If everybody murdered, the world would suck. If everybody, you know, you know what I mean? Like, because you just go outside and somebody starts blasting at you. Like, it would just be terrible, right? So, um, and so his, that's, that's Kantian ethics. You have a duty to do something. And he, he has this notion of the categorical imperative, which is um, uh, act as if your action was universal. Act as act in such a way that if everybody did it, the world would be cool. That's the categorical imperative. Categorical, categorical imperative. The other way you could phrase it is treat people as an ends, not as a means. So don't use people. Like the other people are the goal. Don't treat them as a stepping stone to your goal. So don't you like, like don't steal somebody's work and use it as your own. Take credit for it. Stuff like that. Okay. So we're out of time. Uh, I think you guys uh, got on, got it from looking at the chat here. You should be able to recognize these three things. Kantian ethics is all about your duty. Utilitarianism is all about pleasure versus pain. And divine command theory is, you know, you know, the guru said not to do this, so I'm not going to do this. Your religion says this, so that is correct. Okay. You guys cool? Any questions about this? All right. Have a great weekend, everybody. See you on Monday.